Welcome to Shipwreck Sunday, where we investigate disasters at sea and the impact that they have on the world today. My name is Eleanor. Today, we will be discussing the sinking of the Sao Jose Paquete, Africa, a slave ship that sank in 1794. Before we dive in, I must inform you. This story does include details of a maritime disaster resulting in the loss of a vessel, slavery, racism, and death that may be disturbing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Please note before I begin that I'm not a mariner or expert in the field of maritime history, but I have done my research and will present the information as I understand it and with accurate nautical terminology. In today's episode, I will be including the basics of nautical terminology in the description for anyone who needs it. In today's episode, there will be some terms in the Portuguese language in which I am not fluent, but I will do my best to give accurate pronunciations. Shout out to my brother for suggesting this ship, it is the oldest ship we have ever covered. Being this ship is so old, there is little information on its history before the sinking or even the sinking itself. I've consulted multiple sources like the Smithsonian and the New York Times, but it's still a foggy story, so just keep that in mind as we move forward. If something is muddled, I'll be upfront about it. This is a very sad story, but is it extremely important to acknowledge the faults of slavery and the suffering that blacks were forced to endure? This topic can be very controversial and angering, rightfully so. But please, keep any discussion in the comments civil toward one another. You guys are always really respectful and cool with one another, so we really have nothing to worry about, but I do have to throw that out there. Okay, with the housekeeping out of the way, let's dive into the story. For some backstory, according to a lecture given by Stephen C. Lupkeman in the Transatlantic Slave Database, which tracks slaving ships, there were an estimated 30,000 plus different voyages with a documented 1,008 plus vessels that shipwrecked with slaves on board. However, we have to note this is a massive underrepresentation of the true total number of slaver shipwrecks due to shoddy record keeping, the amount of time that has passed, and the fact that most of these wrecks have yet to be found. There's a fair estimation that there are three to four times the number of wrecks out there that aren't discovered. We also have to note that of the countries that participated in the enslavement of others, particularly black people from Africa, Portugal was the first to participate and the last to cease slavery. With the sinking of slaving vessels, there is a chance for marine archaeologists to connect the dots between hidden transcripts and resistance to slavery. What I mean by this is that it is estimated between 15% and 20% of slaving ships that wrecked sank because of an act of rebellion on board. Although São José Paquete Africa, or the São José for short, is not one of these rumored vessels, there were some discovered prior to 2015 that were suspected to have sunk under these circumstances. That gives us a very interesting, sad perspective on the sinking of slave ships. If you were enslaved, crammed into the smallest spaces possible on a ship, treated horribly, and sold like cattle, you'd rebel too. Even if it meant giving up your life. Being dead would be better than being enslaved. There is no information on where the ship was built, who built her, what building materials were used, and no specifications of the ship. We have no idea how big it was. We do know the ship was Portuguese, and that it was used for the transportation of slaves. Based upon information we have about ships from around that time, they were typically two or three masted, lateen rigged sailing vessels that averaged about 75 feet to 175 feet in length. Typically, these ships would be made of oak, which is a very strong and sturdy wood, averaging about 2,000 trees per ship. Sailing vessels from this time were referred to as 74s and they were common from 1740 until 1810, being built by many different countries, including Portugal. 74s typically had two decks and could measure typically between 2,000 to 3,000 tons burthen. This is builder's old measurement, and it was the measurement used in England from 1650 to 1849 for calculating the cargo capacity of a ship. We can safely assume the San Jose was a 74, as these ships were only supplanted by ironclads, which were common from 1859 to 1890. If you're interested in hearing about an ironclad, check out our video on HMS Victoria. Well, dear listeners, unfortunately, we have nothing. We don't know anything about this vessel other than its name, it was Portuguese, and it carried slaves. So my assumption here, and this is in fact, so take it with a grain of salt, is that it was more than likely commissioned by the Portuguese government, but that hasn't been confirmed. According to the New York Times, the ship traversed oceans and between multiple continents, from small fishing villages in Africa to Europe and the New World. 
What we do know is that the ship departed from Lisbon sometime in 1794, going then to the Mozambique Islands on the east coast of Africa and departing from there on December 3, 1794, with between 400 and 500 slaves trapped in its cargo holds. These people were treated horribly and crammed in this ship tighter than a can of sardines. Each person was restrained to the floor on their backs, and they touched shoulder to shoulder and lined the entire bottom of the holds. They would receive daily breaks to exercise, but other than that, they would spend the majority of their four-month planned journey to Maranjo, Brazil, on the floor. However, their journey would last a total of 24 days. They ran into strong winds that pounded against the ship around the treacherous Cape of Good Hope, where they would strike the bottom of the vessel between two reefs. There was a very detailed account of this according to the NPS virtual forum presentation on December 3rd, 2015, and this area was well documented and heavily monitored. It's known currently as the Lion's Head in Cape Town. They struck this reef right near Cape Town at 2 a.m. on December 27th, 1794, though the ship was not sinking for the time being. Though, we do have to note that when your cargo is living beings, this could be enslaved human beings, this could be livestock, just anything that lives and breathes. You need more ballast weight because the weight shifts as the people in this case move. And the only thing that they had were 1500 iron blocks being used to balance the weight of everyone. And obviously it didn't work. The sinking was a slow death and they were able to affix a line to the shore and haul people off the ship. And by people, I mean the people they deemed worthy of saving. The Portuguese crew and about 280 enslaved people. However, unfortunately, in the slow sinking, 212 would perish with the São José Piquet de Africa, and 12 more would die within a week after the disaster. This wreck happened fairly close to the shore, much like another devastating sinking we covered last year, the SS Atlantic, which wrecked off the coast of Nova Scotia. Check the cards for that one. Waves stirred up this area near the reefs, and people would surely not be able to survive the 400 to 500 foot swim to the shore, especially if they were already weakened and exhausted from being locked up in the cargo hold, because many of them probably didn't know how to swim anyway. The only way the 280 that did survive managed to get off the sinking ship was because of the line tied to the shore. These people that did survive were sadly sold two days after the disaster. We know the information we do from the paraphrased inquiry into the sinking and the testimony of Captain Manuel Huao, which is disturbing. They'd hugged the shoreline to avoid strong winds and heavy seas, but they were too close and struck the reef. The slaves that were saved were only rescued because they were seen as valuable cargo, which is just disgusting and inhumane. According to the testimony, they worked until 5 p.m. when the ship was lost and 212 slaves were lost to the sea. What is even more disturbing is that the crew were referred to as men, but the slaves couldn't even get that respectful of a distinction. They were property and were treated worse than livestock. For example, one man, referred to only as black man in the ship's manifests, was sold and disembarked the vessel on December 22, 1794, leaving to return to Mozambique Island. As we covered with the MTS Oceanos, the sea around this area is very dangerous and tumultuous. She rests in 7 to 15 feet of water, depending upon the tide, and it has been described to churn and turn like a washing machine, making visibility poor and the dive dangerous. So, according to the New York Times, when it was discovered in May of 2015 by the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, the Iziko Museums of South Africa, the Slave Rex Projects, and other partners, it was a particularly difficult excavation. They found the remnants in full view of Lionhead Mountain off the coast of South Africa, and since then have recovered artifacts from it, some of which are on display at the Smithsonian. There were no skeletal remains found in or around the wreckage. Of the recovered items, some were iron ballasts and others were encrusted shackles, which is just heartbreaking to think about people being restrained so horribly, and not only that, but their weight and worth being whittled down to nothing more than iron bars to keep the ship level. The São José Piquete Africa isn't the only slave ship with an incredibly devastating history. It is important that we cover these stories so that we can remember these horribly awful things that human beings did to one another. It's just like the Holocaust in that we want to remember these things and learn from it so we do not repeat this disgusting foul behavior. 
This story shook me to my core and is by far the most heartbreaking, devastating story I've ever read about. These people weren't treated like people. They were treated worse than cattle and were seen only as a monetary commodity. It broke my heart and brought tears to my eyes. And this story in particular will stick with me for a long time. If you live in the United States and would like to remember this ship and the people who not only perished, but those who were sadly sold away and denied their freedom, there is a large exhibit on this ship at the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, DC. I hope this episode honors the loss of the victims aboard the vessel and the fate of the survivors, and that all of us can learn something from this tragedy. Thank you for tuning in to Shipwreck Sunday. If you liked this episode and are listening on YouTube, please give us a like, leave us a comment, and subscribe to our channel. If you liked this episode and are listening on Spotify, Samsung Podcasts, Amazon Music, or another podcast service, please subscribe for more content and leave us a five-star review as it does help us reach more listeners like you. If you have any ships you'd like us to cover, please leave us a comment and you might hear your favorite ship here on the podcast. Check out our community tab for updates and to interact with us. And don't forget to check out our second channel, Speed Force Media. Tune in next Sunday for the story of the Costa Concordia, a massive cruise ship that capsized off the coast of the island of Giglio in 2012, and a ship that is riddled with controversy to this day. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.